Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Bastian Gigerich. I'm the director for uh, defense and military analysis at the IISS. It is my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this webinar on the subject of the utility of military force and public understanding in the UK. Um, this is a paper that arose uh, out of a, a project that uh, uh, Hugh Strawn, uh, Ruth Harris, uh, and also the ISS uh, were involved in, in, in the framework of the Global Strategic Partnership, which is a consortium of organization, organizations that uh, provide research and analytical uh, support to the, to the MOD. Um, and it's my pleasure um, that we have uh, Professor uh, Sir Hugh Strawn here with us today. Uh, and uh, we are also, also uh, having Ruth Harris uh, from RAND, uh, who will uh, both take the floor uh, in a minute um, to uh, give us uh, some of the main takeaways and then we'll have time for discussion. They will, between the two of them, speak for about 25 or so minutes and then we'll uh, open it up for discussion. Uh, all the attendees uh, for this meeting have basically two ways of, uh, uh, of asking questions. Uh, one way is if you hover uh, towards the bottom of your of your screen, you will see these options uh, Q and A uh, that opens a window where you can type in your questions, and then uh, here uh, we, uh, as chairs and and uh, chair and and speakers, can see those questions um, uh, and arrange for them to be answered and perhaps grouped if that's if that's a good way to go about it. Or you can raise your virtual hand um, uh, and uh, uh, we can then see that as well and call upon you. Um, I should say though that uh, when you then are being unmuted um, and ask your question, uh, your, your video should also go live. So uh, uh, make sure that you're prepared for that um, when, when the moment comes. So um, what we want to talk about uh, today uh, the utility of military force and public understanding in the UK. Um, uh, it, it really, it, it, what we want to talk about is the lack of, or perhaps a lack of engagement between the British government uh, and the British people on, on defense policy and, and whether or not that can undermine the potential for the development uh, of, of strategy and for the coherent use of military force. Um, there is a paper, as I said, uh, that uh, Hugh Strawn and, and Ruth Harris have, have prepared. Uh, it was available uh, with the invite and maybe we had a chance to, to look at it, uh, but they will base their remarks around uh, some of the ideas in that paper. Uh, uh, Professor Hugh Strawn is, is the Wadlow Professor of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews, and of course, an Emeritus Fellow of All Souls College at the University of Oxford and also a former council member of the IISS uh, between 2012 and 2017, if I remember correctly. And uh, we have also with us Ruth Harris, who is the research group director for defense, security, and infrastructure at RAND Europe, uh, our partner organization in the, in the GSP. Uh, Ruth has previously uh, had a career in the armed forces, so she will also uh, speak about the subject from, from based on her experience there. Um, so I will not take up uh, much more time uh, and uh, hand over to uh, Hugh to uh, take us into the subject matter. So please, Hugh, over the floor, floor is yours, uh, over to you. Thank you, Bastian. Um, <clears throat> it, it, the origins of this project uh, may sound very um, war studies, uh, political science-y uh, in that um, the uh, brief from the MOD initially to us was to look at um, uh, the clouds of unity, the relationship uh, described by Clausewitz at the end of uh, Book One, Chapter One of On War, where he describes um, war as made up of three elements, um, and uh, the three elements are, are actually qualities; they're not uh, groups of actors. But he then goes on to associate those elements with groups of actors, um, and the actors are uh, the government, the armed forces, and the people. Um, and so what uh, was uh, of concern to me when I was writing the paper and, 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 and to, to uh, the MOD was how was that relationship looking? Um, uh, 
obviously it's a theoretical relationship in British society today. Uh, there are people drop in and out of groups, people leave the armed forces and become civilians, they join the public. Um, major politicians, their careers come to ends and uh, they too uh, then um, join the public and vice versa. So these groups are fluid, it's entirely a theoretical construction. Um, I don't plan to dwell on Clausewitz um, because probably that isn't the sexy way into the subject, um, but uh, I think it was probably helpful just to uh, set that out because the theory has in some ways shaped the approach. And if you look um, at the making of strategy in the United Kingdom today as a three-way relationship, as one involving a conversation between uh, the government and the armed forces, and between the government and the people, and the third element, a conversation between the people and the armed forces, um, then each of those relationships, each of those discussions is, discuss, is, is, is maintained in a somewhat different register um, and um, to a different degree of success. So we're used to the idea that the relationship between uh, the government and the armed forces, and by the armed forces, I mean other agents involved in security, uh, I mean, self-evident, the National Security Advisor, um, the heads of the intelligence services and so on, that relationship um, finds its focus to the National Security Council. We have an institutional framework uh, for it. Um, and I think most people would see the, the establishment of the NSC in 2010 um, as a success. But one of the arguments that come that, that's in the paper is that it is a success, but it has, if you like, further uh, securitized and uh, the relationship and divorced it from mainstream public debate uh, rather than necessarily enhance that public debate. Um, moreover, the level at which it discusses the use of armed force um, has become less public, not necessarily because of the creation of the NSC, but because since um, 2009, um, and the Obama administration, the general drift in the, uh, the conduct of coalition operations, whether in Afghanistan or elsewhere, has been to look at the relationship between special forces and drones um, and to diminish the profile of boots on the ground and indeed as far as possible not to use troops on the ground, um, which has produced a level of, of, of uh, a lessening of public accountability and the public awareness and use of our force. Um, I think, uh, you know, you could go out in the street today uh, and many people, uh, not that go out in the street very much at the moment, but, but you could go out in the street today and, and, and many people would not know there are still British troops in Afghanistan or, or whatever. Um, the second um, relationship is the relationship that the government has uh, with its public. And here it is, um, uh, conducts its discussion in a very different tone. Um, under Tony Blair, uh, before the invasion of Iraq, um, there was uh, an alignment between uh, appeasement in the 1930s on the one hand um, and the need to remove Saddam Hussein on the other. Um, David Cameron similarly tended when he was prime minister to speak in, in, of war in existential terms, uh, to talk about a threat to our way of life. Um, and the striking thing I think in both cases uh, was that there was not a readiness to commit the resource or the troops, um, the money or the, or, or the troops, um, commensurate with the level of threat that was being described. Um, and the presumption, presumably in much of this, was that the only sort of war um, that the public could easily recognize and identify with was major war, was a war that was shaped by understandings of the Second World War. Um, and although Prime Ministers since David Cameron have moved away from that rhetoric, partly because actually they've addressed war much less frequently. Uh, one of the things, of course, that has emerged during the course of the COVID-19 um, crisis has been a resurrection of Second World War vocabulary in relation both to uh, addressing the virus, but also because we've had the, uh, the, the uh, anniversary, 75th anniversary of VE Day. So the notion in the public mind that war is rather than other sorts of war um, has become uh, embedded and is part of the, of the dialogue between government and the armed forces. Um, and the result is a degree of, of uh, disconnect, principally because you know, the discussion that goes on between government and the armed forces is essentially the idea of 
war conducted in a more limited fashion, um, and yet the vocabulary we use is, 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 is that of uh, major war. So um, where do we uh, go from there? Well, part of the assumption also within this Okay. Um, the assumption seems to be um, that um, the uh, that the public is not to be trusted, that the public cannot have a properly informed view of what Britain's armed forces are doing um, and how they should be uh, treated, um, and that at one level creates a democratic deficit. Um, we'll talk, uh, and Ruth in particular, I think we'll talk a bit later about some of the implications of this. Um, but the assumption is also extraordinarily ill-founded. Um, opinion polling evidence uh, shows that in many respects, um, the public is extremely well aware of the implications of the use of arms. Um, Well-known uh, observation that public uh, approval of the armed forces is very high. Um, and it has remained consistently high over decades of uh, uh, currently runs at the order of sort of 75% approval ratings. But what is also striking is that there is public support for the use of armed force at comparable levels. Um, roughly three quarters of those polls uh, believe that we should required honor the Article 5 uh, commitment to, uh, in the Atlantic Charter. Uh, large proportion, not quite as many, in the high 60s, uh, recognize that the changing character of war includes humanitarian interventions and other sorts of operation. Um, and uh, there is within that, therefore, a degree of acceptance of the use of armed force, which belies the notion that there is public uh, opposition to, uh, uh, to boots on the ground. And what this reflects is findings that uh, have come out of the US, particularly in the context of the Cold War. Bruce Russett, an American political scientist, uh, looked at public opinion towards the end of the Cold War um, and concluded that actually what happens that people what, what, in democracies is not so much that the wider electorate changes its views very much and changes its views in a volatile way, but that the press and the media and therefore governments themselves tend to over-identify divergent elite groups as the source of difference. Um, in other words, they, they equate opposition to their own policies uh, with democratic uh, politics and therefore with um, uh, those groups who are advocating opposition rather than, uh, sorry, right, backtrack. They tend to identify those changes of opinion with the public rather than with the elite groups who are their advocates. Russett's conclusions when he looked at American public opinion over the course of the, of, 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 uh, the 1980s was that the public um, were neither hawks nor doves, but owls, that actually they were very wise and very consistent in their views. However, what the opinion polling evidence also shows um, is the public has very little understanding uh, of um, the workings of the Foreign Commonwealth Office. In other words, it has very little understanding of how British foreign policy is put together, and that, after all, is the context within which um, military operations are conducted. And it also has very little understanding of uh, the Ministry of Defence, um, or indeed uh, of the specifics of the armed forces themselves. In other words, and this is a familiar refrain, there is plenty of, of, of sympathy for the armed forces, but not really the level of full understanding or empathy, which explains why they go in operations. And I think if you uh, address some of the, the, the ways in which the public begin to understand um, our armed forces, then you will realize why that should be the case. Um, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, um, their understanding has been disseminated through the work of the military charities. Um, and it's those charities to raise money, uh, and they do so for those who are victims of war uh, whether directly wounded by war or whether the relatives of those who have been. Um, and that is absolutely uh, uh, proper that they should be doing that. Uh, but the consequences of their doing that is that they have filled the vacuum in terms of public communication about war uh, that has been left by the absence of more overt communication on the part of the government. Um, if I can be anecdotal for a minute, 
Um, when I used to lecture at Sandhurst, which is now far too long ago, in the late 1970s, um, at that point, the, um, uh, we were required to uh, brief platoon commanders on the situation in Northern Ireland um, before they faced um, the reality. Um, and those platoon commanders, if they then found themselves in the middle of an incident, would speak directly to the BBC uh, to explain what was going on. In other words, uh, communication was not done through an anonymous Ministry of Defence uh, communications uh, network, which simply repeated formulaic phrases. There was a degree of understanding and direct engagement, which communicated itself to the public. Now, how in the past have we done this? I mean, how have we created a better level of engagement between the public um, and the armed forces? Um, some countries, not this country, um, have a more participatory democracy. Uh, we've tried it a couple of times with referendums recently, uh, but broadly speaking, we live in an electoral democracy. We don't put national security through the participatory process. Um, if you read about uh, Athens and the Peloponnesian War, um, that was a participatory democracy in the sense that those who took the decision to go to war uh, would themselves end up fighting that war. There was a close relationship between political responsibility and military service. And how that's more often found reflection um, in modern European societies has been through the principle of national service, uh, through compulsory and military service. Um, this country has no long-standing inheritance in relation to national service in the way that a country like France or Germany does, um, because uh, we have only used um, conscription in times of major war, um, and that is in the two world wars, and for a, for a comparatively short period, after the Second World War. Um, one of the proposals in the paper is that we might have a debate about national service once again, but let me stress that what um, uh, 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 we are not addressing in the paper is some notion of resuscitation of a 1950s sort of polishing your boots and square bashing um, uh, conscription. What we're thinking about um, is some of the European models uh, the idea that if we're really um, under threat, uh, in inverted commas, from hybrid warfare, uh, which implies an attack on societies, that there has to be a level of societal engagement um, and that conscription and national service might be a way to do that. And it is striking uh, that a number of countries in Europe, including um, our nearest neighbours in France, uh, are uh, once again um, launching a debate on national service at a point uh, when it seemed as though national service was something of the past. Um, and Sweden and Lithuania, to take two examples, have actually returned to national service, uh, having got rid of it. The other way that Britain has engaged um, with its uh, people, in fact, the, the more frequent way in which Britain has engaged with its people in terms of na the national security debate, has been through asking them to pay for it. Um, the Navy, uh, was Britain's principal defence. That was one reason why Britain did not need conscription. And because the Navy was the principal uh, defence, it was also um, an expensive solution because it needed maintaining in peacetime as well as in wartime. You could improvise an army in times of crisis, you could not easily improvise a Navy. So it was a, a persistent cost. Um, and we often forget today that income tax, when it was introduced, uh, was a war tax, a war tax introduced in the Napoleonic Wars. And during the 19th century, ministers like uh, Gladstone in particular, uh, but those of a similar persuasion, saw taxation as the way in which you could test the public resolve for war, because those who were in favor of war um, would uh, support the principle of income tax, and those who were opposed would, 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 would reject the principle of income tax, or so we'll keep in, in, income tax low. And until 1914, uh, most of the British public uh, did not serve in the armed forces, uh, but quite a lot of them paid for it, uh, paid for them. Um, we have now reached a situation where we are used to the notion that defence is a cost uh, on the exchequer, which has to be budgeted for, which we pay for. We have lost the idea that we actually pay for wars. Um, most striking about the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan is that there has been no public accounting uh, to all intents and purposes for those wars. There was no special taxation voted for it. 
there was no special borrowing uh, voted um, for those wars. And indeed, when we had the 2008-9 financial crisis, nobody was suggesting that came out of uh, the consequences of war. I mean, it is extraordinary how we've divorced the debate about public finance from the debate about defence. But that, if we have no conscription, is actually one of the ways into establishing a more direct discussion uh, between the public um, and the state about what the utility of military force might be. So the question uh, that we then address in the report is how do we actually begin to uh, re-engage once more? And part of the answer, as I already suggested, um, is that we do actually, apart from anything else, be readier to have a debate. We are more open. Um, uh, obviously, one cannot afford to be open about things that are potentially secret, uh, but much of national strategy actually uh, rests on a broad statement of principles, as every national security strategy tends to show. And within that, I think the recent experience of um, the coronavirus has actually shown uh, that it is perfectly possible to have a discussion with the public um, in which they behave as mature and responsible citizens, uh, aware, informed, um, and uh, sensitive to the issues of security. After all, COVID-19 is itself a national security uh, issue. Um, and it's at that juncture, I think I should hand over to Ruth, who will say uh, a few words about uh, one or two of the ideas which we think follow out from that, in particular initially, uh, that resilience. Thank, Thank you, Hugh. Um, um, so, so I'll, I'll briefly, briefly cover three, three themes, themes, mainly on the subject, subject of resilience. resilience. I'm, I'm going to look at it from a conceptual point um, and can talk about engagement and, and also about technology. technology. There are, of course, many more, but my main aim here is to draw out some lessons that you can read across um, Ruth, and we can discuss. Ruth, yeah. can, I, can I just stop you one second because you have an echo on there uh, on your when you when you speak. Um, I don't sure. know whether there's something that creates a feedback loop or something uh, close to your microphone. Can we try again? Uh, is that any better? Yes. Is that, is that any, any better? better? I think it's better. Let's try. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I'm going to start, start by talking, talking about um, concepts. Concept. Um, I'm going to look at a conceptual um, evolution that I would argue needs to take, take place. place. Um, to date, to date most, most definitions of resilience have been around the ability to absorb and recover from shock, but this ignores possibly the deterrence effect of resilience and the possible effects of cohesion offered by a resilient society. If we think about resilience in a responsive way, then we'll struggle to, to evolve a society which is a driver and delivery method for resilience if we only think about it in that way. So there's a need to examine what a revised definition might offer. But, but also there's the futures and foresight te techniques, techniques that might help to examine this and, and, and how it might evolve in the future. This, this is clearly a whole of government and whole force issue. issue. It's, it's not, not just or even necessarily the dominant one of defence. defense. This, this speaks directly, directly to the concept of fusion doctrine and would, and would allow defence to embrace this concept perhaps in a way that it is designed to be but it hasn't been in, in certain fields. fields. Concepts, concepts of societal resilience must, must allow this is a, a this is a really, really a dynamic and, and ultimately profoundly political issue. issue. Focusing on existing societal vulnerabilities is not arguably enough. enough. But looking, looking forward also requires a critical and shared review to really appreciate where we are strong, where we're weak, um, and where we're vulnerable, a sort analysis, if, if you like. Um, and part, part of having a successful concept of resilience is our ability to check in on it. Sorry, Ruth, Ruth, sorry yeah. to interrupt again. We, we still have this echo. Uh, so I'm asking tech support. Okay, sure um, uh, uh, Tom uh, and tech support, is there anything we can do about this echo, please? Hi, Ruth. If you go down to your bottom left and click the upwards arrow, you should be able to choose your microphone. It might be that you just have two sources going at the same time. I think I just have one, so... If the has one. Is that, is that any better? better? Uh, is that, is that any better? And uh, no, unfortunately, not. It's still an echo. Um, you could try just using your native microphone on your laptop. I can, I can try. try. It's usually not very good, which is why I don't have it on. <laughs> Let's try that because there's a, quite a strong echo otherwise. Okay. 
Is that any better? I think that works. Let's try that. Can you hear me better? Yeah, I think the echo is gone. Okay, that's good. Um, so part of having a successful um, concept of resilience is really our ability to check in on it, to have kind of robust and meaningful metrics by which it can be measured. It's worth rem remembering really that preparedness is not limited to physical methods, but also to the psychological state of a nation. And really that is more difficult to, me to measure. Um, Scandinavian models are often held up to, to be the, the, the archetypal method to follow in this area. But focusing on what makes um, the UK setting similar and different to, to other nations should support a more useful understanding as to why certain models may, may or may not be transferable, but not just from Scandinavia, maybe from Israel and the Baltics. To talk for a moment about engagement. Um, I think resilience doesn't happen without engagement and engagement cannot be meaningful without understanding. So this must go both ways. Government understanding of society and society's understanding of government. The method for this though is through a national strategy and that's not dictated, but it is somewhere in which there is debate. Previous efforts to support this, for example, from the paper it spoke, speaks about um, 2015's SDSR, were not success, successful, and I would argue that really more needs to be done, and that the government must maintain the ear of the people. Norway is a good example. From public forums and debate ahead of the formulation of the country's long-term plan, this is expected, anticipated, and understood by the Norwegian people. This does not mean that there's like a harmonious accord across Norway, but there is active debate um, and an attempt to cut and paste, obviously, a total concept into the UK, a total defence concept into the UK is not being suggested, but there might be elements that are appropriate. Recent referendums in the UK have made the government perhaps understandably nervous of this approach, but debate does not have to mean a binding decision. Debate means debate. If the government and society only ever change, engage at times of crisis, for example, a cyber attack, extreme weather events, or as recently the pandemic, then the relationship, I would argue, would be one of crisis um, and certainly lack trust. The coronavirus has perhaps brought this into sharp relief um, and, and some of the existing challenges more into sharp relief. First, the sort of relevance of the distinction between home and away. We're not remote from events overseas, if arguably we ever were. And two, the, per the pervasive effects of, of such an event across the economy, education, transport, culture, and yes, even sport, um, to name but a few. And thirdly, the response and going forward preparedness should address prevention and deterrence, which, which you will talk about a little bit more in a moment. But this must be from government, society, and the tools of state, so all professionals, um, including the armed forces, and I would argue should be coherent uh, with Europe as well. We have an opportunity now um, to achieve a better understanding of a shared responsibility of domestic security through the integrated review. Um, to do this across government, we should involve private sector society, particularly in the light of threats from, from pandemics, from terrorism, from cyber, biological and of course chemical attacks. Last week we saw the launch of the SpaceX rocket. An example of increasing involvement of commercial enterprise, okay, not in this country, but through this of public and society in areas which were really previously the purview of government. Building a recent uh, resilient society means reaching out to people and our neighbours in, in really a planned and meaningful way. And finally then to talk about technology. Now for me, when technology um, is discussed in relation to resilience, I see it as having a duality in its role. So on the one hand, it seems to be driving more divisiveness in societies, creating echo chambers and filter bubbles. And when we talk about this quite a lot around, it can make society more divided in general. Access, know-how, marginalized communities, et cetera, which we're reading a lot about and seeing on the news, sadly. But technology also has the ability to give voice where previously a kind of submissive and ignorant acceptance was, was assumed. If it didn't exist, it was assumed. As societal ownership underpins resilience, technology needs to be used as an enabler rather than yet another layer of complexity, fragility, and perhaps vulnerability. 
Historically, the public has seemingly been more involved in volunteering their efforts and capabilities for non-technological causes. You know, firefighters, the great organisations of the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, animal environmental support organisations. Trying to imagine how a society can encourage or facilitate the creation of a technology cyber volunteer organisation is challenging, but there really is some evidence. Perhaps Estonia is probably one of the best examples. It can be helpful to you sort of view this from three perspectives. A human behaviour perspective, so mental well-being, dealing with issues of truth decay. Um, a government perspective, how you might build and maintain a resilient society in the light of change, a policy issue really. And a security perspective, you know, what are the technological weaknesses and vulnerabilities that can be exploited to reduce vital resilience, um, supply chain, private sectors, foreign ownership, etc. And finally, then, the, just to think in terms of technology about the brittleness of infrastructure. In the connected kind of on-demand society, critical supply chains have low resilience, particularly in the case of disruption, as we've seen, but really also things like cyber attacks on transport nodes or banking, for example. There's been little work done to understand really the cascading effects of interconnected chains or work to design more robust systems including sort of continuity plans that aren't just there in paper, but that are funded and practice backups in place involving exercises, which involves society. The impact of interconnected supply chains is not obvious. It's very difficult to unpick. And at times it's unpalatable perhaps, because it reveals possibly dependencies that we have and who they're with that we're maybe less comfortable with. And it's also challenging to build resilience within these. Planning for one element of failure is, is often common in organisations and in government, but for that kind of pervasive threat, the commitment to solution must really involve everybody. And finally, seeking to maximise economic gain at the expense of resilience and therefore of national security is genuinely counterintuitive. So if we ignore security, one of the casuals will be the economy with what can be and, and might be a, a long and painful recovery process. I'll hand back now to Hugh, who I know is going to talk a little about deterrence. Um, I'll be very brief because I realise we're, we're, we're pushed for time, but simply following on Ruth's points about resilience, um, which seemed to me the, the obvious way into a public debate in the current environment, um, I think it's important that we recognise the relationship between resilience and deterrence. Um, the presumption that there is a level of societal engagement within uh, our national security system is what is really as, uh, essential to traditional notions of deterrence. After all, nuclear deterrence during the Cold War depended on passive public participation because essentially the public was being held hostage um, to the danger of nuclear war as part of that deterrence structure. Um, and both the Falklands War of, of, of um, 1982 and possibly both the wars of Iraq uh, with Iraq can be seen as deterrence failures. The presumption in the first case uh, that Britain in 1982 would not be ready to fight over the Falklands and the presumption on the part of Saddam Hussein that the West would not have uh, the bottle, if you like, to be prepared to fight either over the Caesar of Kuwait or indeed possibly even to fight in 2003 um, because of the level of casualties that would be sustained and the public reaction that would be evoked. Uh, going to war in 1982 was conceived um, uh, subsequently as having reinforced deterrence. Um, a deterrence failure, uh, incurring a deterrence failure in order to, to, to go to war in order to boost deterrence success seems to be an odd way around of doing things. Far better to be in a position where your adversary never even calls that into question. And one of the striking aspects of the 2015 SDSR, which, which Ruth mentioned, was there was a real uh, attempt within that to engage with broader deterrence, not just nuclear deterrence. Um, but a, a, an attempt which largely misfired because in the end it was never picked up in a public debate, it never became uh, a high profile matter, although, although it's certainly within the document. Um, and it seems to me essential um, that if we are actually to have an effective deterrent system, whether we're talking about something that operates at the nuclear or the conventional levels, um, then we need uh, to have a public engagement as part of that. And indeed, 
the very fact that nuclear deterrence now is so controversial is precisely one of the reasons why we should be having the debate. Um, it is precisely because uh, there is a lack of real understanding of how deterrence operates um, that we can have a degree of cynicism about deterrence and where it lies. Um, and our current preoccupation specifically with hybrid warfare, with the, the notion that there is a threat mounted to our societies externally, which uses various instruments short of war as well as those engaged with war, rests on a presumption of our own societal vulnerability um, of the exposure of our society to those sort of threats, whether they be fake news or indeed um, psychological warfare or other forms of operations. Um, and that in itself, therefore, argues that if we wish to deter successfully, uh, we need to incorporate some of the, the, the sides of, of the aspects of resilience, which will create um, of, uh, deterrence. Um, in other words, these things are integrated um, and uh, one feeds into the other. And much of this can be done in small measures rather than in big measures. And much of it, I reiterate that, is just about having a debate so that public understanding is uh, greater and so that empathy uh, is there to replace sympathy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to both uh, Hugh and Ruth for, for explaining the uh, thinking behind the paper and the arguments uh, and, and some of the debates um, uh, around it. I think uh, a very important point um, uh, to stress that there is a, um, a, a triangular uh, relationship here that, that needs to be uh, 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 strengthened uh, between uh, government, the armed forces and, and, and the public um, uh, writ large. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, it's very interesting uh, how you explained what that means in the context of so a, a resilient society and in the context of uh, deterrence. Um, uh, we have a couple of questions um, that uh, people have submitted uh, that I want to get to uh, uh, in a minute, but um, I want to uh, abuse my privilege here for, for just a second, uh, if I may, um, to ask you, you know, you've, you've both been arguing there's a, uh, there is the need to have a conversation with the public that is based on trust and, and that is based on a lot more engagement than perhaps we have, we have seen uh, uh, recently. Um, uh, so, so government needs to create the space, I suppose, and, and the, the opportunity for that, for that triangular conversation to take place. Uh, and of course, uh, 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 Ruth, uh, you mentioned the, the integrated review, uh, and, and so perhaps there's an opportunity now. And I wanted to ask you both uh, whether you think there is appetite for that conversation that you are both um, calling for um, uh, in government, uh, if you see that, that appetite uh, existing, um, uh, and if it does, um, how, you might, how you might go uh, about starting that, that particular conversation. I don't know, Hugh, do you want to start and then, and then Ruth maybe? Yeah, fine. Uh, I, I think um, if you asked me that question a month ago, I would have said uh, my sense is the government's appetite for that sort of debate um, was strong because um, the response to the to the pandemic had had rested on a very similar set of relationships um, and uh, a readiness to engage the discussion uh, involving government experts and the public um, in a way that that uh, suggested that there was a recognition that at least in relation to one national security threat, one very specific one, this was the way forward. Um, and I do believe there is a genuine read across from one to the other. The fact that um, the government has more recently tended to lose control of the narrative may make it wary about doing that. Um, but I would also argue that the integrated review process um, will only come alive and will only secure uh, real national ownership if there is a readiness to have a wider debate. Um, it was fashionable uh, in the immediate uh, uh, thinking before the pandemic about the integrated review to refer back to the 1997-98 uh, strategic defence review as one which ha had had a level of public engagement, had encouraged debate um, and was seen to have, broadly speaking, delivered in, in terms of what it was trying to do. Um, uh, some would see it as, as the most successful in recent years. 
Um, and um, I, I think we can overhype the success, but the point is um, that it at least suggested you could do that without losing track. Um, and and um, the co public consultation before the 2015 SDSR um, was quite frankly minimal. Um, there was some wider engagement with um, uh, out, uh, experts from outside government, um, but not actually a level of public debate. Um, and I would argue we now have, partly thanks to the pandemic, the sort of framework within which this discussion could take place, um, which could also be disseminated outside London. I mean, now we're getting used to communicating um, uh, online, that enables that wider debate, but also we have resilience groups and others who are beginning to address some of these issues and trying to find solutions um, through a level of common understanding, which work at the local level as well as the national level. So I think there are, there are tremendous opportunities here um, to have uh, the integrated review more firmly focused in the national debate and therefore in national ownership. Thank you. Ruth, can I ask you to add on to that? Sure. I think that the, what, what Hugh says there about in the past that the, in sort of the discussions with government and society have been very limited, I, I would certainly agree, and, and particularly in the, in the last one, when, I suppose, because one expected more because they said it was going to happen. And that's one of the problems. If you say it's going to, you're going to do it, you've got to do it. You can't half commit to it. Um, and there seems to be a, a habit, and, and I suppose I do understand where it comes from, of, you know, folding our arms around the, the centre and MOD and government in an integrated review, keeping it all in-house, and then a, a big reveal, if you like, almost at, at the end, when it's too late. The, the big reveal ends in some debate. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's the wrong way round. You know, perhaps do a partial reveal. This is what we're thinking about in order to, to spark a debate. I mean, as Hugh said, that there is this sort of increased activity online now anyway, this drumbeat of government announcements, people are used to you know, tuning in, et cetera. Maybe one can change the tone of them into a different subject. And I think we should capture that trend. Um, it'll need to be altered slightly. And of course, there are security concerns and things that can't be addressed. And, and I, but I think that's generally understood. You know, the, the society is not stupid. They understand that. that there are some things that can't be spoken about. Um, I touched briefly on the work that, that Norway did prior to their long-term plan. Very open debate with allies uh, as, you know, not, not classified at all, but with allies that then went out to society in Norway and said, look, this is what our allies think of us. This is what's going to affect our planning. What do you think? Um, easy to do, smaller society, you know, perhaps um, different demographic, but th there are lessons to, to be learned on that. But certainly, you know, do some partial reveal, give the country something to talk about so they feel confident in the debate. Thank you very much. Very interesting uh, uh, suggestions from both of you there. I want to turn to some of the questions that were uh, uh, submitted here through the, the Q&A uh, function. And I want to group two together. And one is from Desmond Bowen and, and one is from, from uh, Ben Barry. Uh, and they, they kind of are related. And, and, and Des is asking, uh, or suggesting that there seems to be a tension between the utility of force and the need for better or stronger resilience. And he's saying most of resilience at home needs civil capabilities such as cyber, health, critical infrastructure, you know, flood defenses, those kinds of things. And, and he's asking whether the armed forces won't be overlooked in that integrated review because the focus might be on those kinds of things. Uh, and Ben is asking a related question, um, uh, namely uh, suggesting that there's now so much public appreciation and gratitude to uh, organizations like the National Health Service uh, uh, and, and others. Um, uh, isn't, again, the, the, aren't the UK armed forces perhaps going to be uh, on the losing end of that part of the conversation? I was wondering whether you both had, had reactions to that. I don't know who wants to kick off. Hugh, do you want to kick off? Well, I, I suppose a quick answer to Ben, um, that, uh, of course, the political momentum will, I, I suspect, be going away from the armed forces, and many people have expected that. Um, but in a way, part of that is going to be uh, uh, my response to, to Desmond, Desmond's question, which is that um, national, the whole point about um, our embrace of the construction of national security since 2010 is that these things are integrated, not separate. 
um, and um, you know to become tribal at this point in terms of what is for defense um, which of course is the default position of so many government departments but to become tribal in relation to what is for defense and what is for health and what is for um, you know this is actually missing the point um, you know the banner under which this should be happening um, and and Ruth um, is is um, the banner of fusion doctrine. I mean, if that still has legs and if that's what Mark Sedwell is tied up to, then it seems to me the whole point about here is how do we deliver um, these things jointly for effect? And therefore, on that basis, um, of course, the armed forces are ultimately deployed for operations overseas. Um, but, you know, we've seen the use of the armed forces domestically. They're being used right now in relation to, to handling the pandemic. Um, and I'm not saying that we want that to become their primary role, uh, not least because the more they do that, the more they disqualify themselves in terms of training and other capabilities for the external role. Um, but it does at least bring home the point that this is a seamless web. And I think part of the debate we have to have is exactly that interrelationship, that these things do not stand in isolation. Of course, they require different levels of expertise. I mean, if I can reverse the point, and just look uh, specifically at the response to the pandemic, it's very, strong, very strange to me how much the planning in anticipation of the pandemic, which after all was flagged up as a tier one national security risk in the 2015 NSS, um, that how much the planning of that was simply dealt with as an exercise in epide epi can't even say it, epidemiology, um, rather than in terms of what it did for supply chains, in terms of what it might do for other forms of security, um, and uh, the knock-on effects that it could have, for example, in terms of overseas relations um, because the pandemic didn't uh, observe borders. So um, it's, it's important, I think, that we bring a joined up view um, and rather than see these things as separable, separable elements. Thank you. Ruth. Yes, I agree entirely with you in terms of, you know, that, that was the the clues in the title, right? It's integrated um, and, and fusion doctrine. If we go back to a sort of a comprehensive approach, I mean, there's a repetition here, isn't there? Um, the one thing I would add is these issues of cyber, health, critical infrastructure, they don't just happen in the UK, they also happen overseas in the countries we're engaged with when we use force. So issues of critical infrastructure are relevant to the utility of force, both at home and overseas. Issues of health, if we think about Ebola, if we think about um, issues that happen around critical infrastructure and extreme weather events. So the UK's response, military response to, to the, the extreme weather events in the Caribbean, for example. And how we use force when it's, it's wide and various now. So actually the skills that can be learnt in, in the UK at home are relevant to defense, they're relevant to security and they're relevant to the individuals in it because they're the same skills quite often that get used. Not, not always, of course, because there's the hard military skills which we must maintain for reasons we understand, but there are other skills that are still ultimately relevant. And cyber is a really good example of it. And I think trying to see cyber as a military element to cyber and then as a domestic element to cyber is not helpful. It's not how cyber works and it's not how those who conduct warfare through cyber operate and think. So I think integration is the, is the understanding and, and a global integration in how we use that, um, that, that utility of force, both at home and overseas. I'm not necessarily saying that, you know, it should be a military only cyber area, but perhaps this is a ro role for reservists as well. And the better integration of reservists into what, how we use these skills and how we integrate at, um, at home and then utility of that and taking the learning of that into to things we, we might conduct abroad. Thank you. Very, very interesting points again. And then I think if I may summarize uh, uh, an argument to to uh, not fight the integrated setting, but make the argument uh, uh, for the armed forces within that setting and, and do tell the good story where, where it can be told. Uh, understanding, of course, that that is not not at all uh, uh, easy or, or, or trivial. Uh, questions are pouring in now. So I'm going to, again, group two together. Um, uh, one uh, from uh, Toby Dickinson and one from Abigail Watson. Uh, and uh, uh, Toby uh, is, is saying, uh, so you contrasted the UK's representative approach to democratic decision-making with other nations' more direct approaches, but he's, he's actually then asking, uh, 
uh, what parliamentarians uh, might uh, uh, have to do uh, differently to enhance public understanding and engagement, so uh, to also to do their part uh, of enabling that conversation that you that you uh, called for. And and Abigail Watson is 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 touching on a slightly different point, but she's uh, saying. Um, uh, that uh, the UK perhaps falls behind some allies uh, when it comes to parliamentary oversight uh, uh, in general, but in particular, the point she was making is, is oversight of special forces uh, roles in operations. But if we can take that together as a question of what's the parliamentary, uh, the responsibility of parliamentarians here, uh, and is there an argument to be made that parliamentary oversight should be stronger in the UK or not? Who wants to take that away? Um, well, you I'm start, happy yeah. to answer it, but I, but I don't want to say Bruce got a, a view. Um, the short answer is yes, parliamentary oversight should be stronger and it would be part of the uh, absolutely central to the to greater public understanding. Um, and um, the the uh, I think one of the aspects here is is that you know, we, we have got an increasingly strong committee system within parliament. Um, and in relation to defense, national security and foreign affairs, um, there are uh, committees that are functioning very well and very effectively. But what we tend to have um, is insufficient engagement with those committees by, the, by, by government. I mean, what you tend to have um, is a formulaic response to any report rather than engagement with that report. So a report comes out um, which stands in its own right, um, rather than uh, resulting necessarily in a major debate in the House, or rather than producing a full uh, response from the government, it tends to get uh, simply uh, the least attention possible. And it de the report depends on the media picking up its message, which is some sometimes, of course, happens that the press will report uh, on what a parliamentary report has said in order to give it mileage. So um, absolutely, Parliament has a, has a major role to play in, in, in bridging these, these forms and uh, in holding uh, government to account. Um, and if we don't have that, um, then uh, we will be failing in terms of getting a, a proper a, a democratic response. Ruth? I think possibly that how we've worked recently um, since the lockdown is is helpful to think about the the how do we how do parliamentarians sort of engage etc and how do we understand this sort of public understanding um, you know more time out in the constituencies more time understanding and I, I think that that's possibly a, a good thing and maybe we, we build more on that so that you have a, an individual trust of your parliamentarian um, and, and have a, de a, a debate that's a more feels like a more personal debate um, because defense means quite different things and social resilience means different things depending whereabouts you live in the UK um, and the paper talks a bit about sort of the urban environment as a, the things that would concern you in terms of resilience compared to the rural one and it really is quite different I mean I'm not sure you know sat in rural Oxfordshire that we think too much about terrorism here okay but but, but in central London, for sure you do, you know, and certainly in the past when I've travelled on the tube, it is in my mind. But, and I think understanding context of people is, is really important in the debate. Bringing that back into Parliament so that there's a, a rounded debate to try and dilute this sort of the debate in London uh, versus everywhere else um, is the challenge. But I think, you know, more time spent recently uh, you know outside of london is maybe a, a good thing i mean time will tell certainly other you know other organizations i work with that have felt that and um, you know the change in the way that we work and the dynamic that we have and our priorities as people and it'd be interesting to see how, how that plays out thanks bastian thank you very much um uh a couple more questions. Uh, we won't be able to get to all of them, uh, uh, and some of them uh, delve into the deeper uh, or the, the finer print of Clausewitz. Um, so uh, 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 we maybe set up a separate conversation for for, for some of those. But um, one question I wanted to uh, pick up, um, uh, and and uh, Hugh, you mentioned uh, the national service idea in your presentation. I know, I know it it was picked up by the media when the when the paper uh, came out, and I know it is actually not the main point uh, uh, of the paper. Um, uh, 
uh, uh, but but uh, I do want to uh, pick up a question that is being asked by by Alistair Mansfield, and he's asking. Uh, with many school leavers looking to postpone university, you know, as a result of COVID-19 and, and just the situation that we're in, is there now an opportunity um, uh, to perhaps uh, go in that direction, have a trial national service system, something to capitalize uh, and, and turn uh, a, an issue brought about by COVID into an opportunity for the, for the kind of problems uh, that you mentioned. Uh, so while I understand national service isn't at all the main point in the paper, um, what, what are your thoughts on this particular one? Um, and sorry, I need to unmute. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'd agree that there, there is an opportunity there. Um, and I think the important thing, if um, there were to be any move towards national service or some, uh, which I think probably wouldn't necessarily have to be exclusively military. I mean, I think there are many other ways of thinking this through. Um, but if there, if, if, if there were, if we were to go down, it's very important that it goes with consent. Um, and I think there probably would be an element of consent at the moment because people have recognized uh, the function the public can play in terms of delivering on a security uh, idea. And, and I think too, um, you know, what we probably need is some system where people could have a taster, which is really what the French are talking about, um, to get some sense of, 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 of what it would be about and why we'd be doing it. Um, we need to be clear, why do we think we need it? Um, and uh, most of it uh, is about societal resilience, rather more than it's about military service. At the moment, we are not structured to cope uh, with a massively expansive, uh, expanded re um, recruiting system. Um, and uh, that, I, I think, is a, is, is a sort of second order, but also a very important question, which is we've become so used to the reduction in size of the armed forces, how would we actually handle the possibility of a re-expansion of the armed forces? Um, because even if we now depend on technology as a force multiplier rather than mass in terms of manpower or women power, um, the point remains that there are certain skills the armed forces are critically short of, which are present in civilian life, um, which uh, they might well want to mobilize in terms of national emergency, um, and which are, we don't think of necessarily as, as exclusively or conventionally military. Um, and there, is a, there could well be any for mass, uh, particularly uh, given the very small size of the armed forces right now. So there is a direct military need. Um, and I think we need to distinguish between what we see in this respect, what we see as, as, as a sort of societal imperative, um, which relates to the issues of resilience and so on, um, and what we might see as a military imperative. But again, recognizing that these things can be part of a seamless web, that they need to be integrated to think what their relationship is one to the other. So I, I would agree there is a moment, now is a very good moment to have such a discussion. Hugh, thank you very much. Uh, Ruth, can I ask you to add uh, your thoughts on the on the on the national service idea? Yes, just briefly. I, I saw um, a comment. I think it was on LinkedIn to the to the publication uh, in the Times that, that that talked about and focused on, on national service, and and the comment sort of was someone who was ex serving from from many years ago, and they kind of commented that that previously this hadn't worked in the UK because. They actually, the people who were doing national service were a burden rather than a rather than a help, and actually had taken a lot of effort, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think that therein lies the problem: is one, it's terminology. National service people don't think about the words what they mean, i.e., service to the nation. Um, you know, loaded terms like conscription, like press gang, and things like this, and that's people's understanding of it. And as soon as you say something like national service to someone who's sort of experienced it or, or worked with people who are doing national service in the fact that they'll remember bad stories and regale them. So there is a reformatting and a reshaping of what that means. And, and, and as you said, that's all about the debate that, that needs to be had in order to achieve that. And, and it's, you know, if we really think about the words and what they really mean, you know, service to the nation, it calls into to discussion ideas of what national identity is do you want to serve the nation how do you relate to the nation and that that too is an important debate you know if one to take some sort of constructivist view of how we identify ourselves is it through our religion is it through our group is it through our sexuality is it through our job it will open up that debate 
But I think that that's a really important debate to be had, and not just on this subject. It's an important societal debate to be had, of which national services is one part of that, or servicing, you know, service of the nation. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, that was very enjoyable. We are unfortunately uh, uh, up against the clock and are now officially in overtime. So I'll have to bring this uh, uh, to to a close. And I know I'm disappointing a few people who have. Uh, uh, put through questions, uh, 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 we will make sure that uh, uh, Ruth and, and Hugh see those questions um, uh, and uh, are aware of, of what other interesting points were raised um, and maybe they uh, inspire future interventions and, 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 and future papers. Um, and just to uh, you know, thank uh, Hugh and Ruth uh, for speaking uh, about this important paper. It is available for download on the uh, event page here uh, at the ISS. It is uh, available for download uh, from the RAND Europe page. Um, so please, if you haven't yet, uh, make sure you have a look at this paper, read it. Uh, uh, it is well worth your time and touches upon very important issues, uh, in particular that, that communications gap. Uh, perhaps that does exist between the British government and the British people and, and what that might mean um, uh, for uh, the development of strategy and the coherent uh, use of force. Uh, so thank you very much, um, uh, Hugh and uh, Ruth. Uh, very enjoyable uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you uh, who attended uh, in our virtual audience here um, for your participation, for asking uh, interesting and challenging questions. Again, my apologies that we didn't get to all of them. Uh, but uh, I think we got, gave it a, a, a good whack. Um, this is the second um, webinar that I'm chairing this weekend. It's the second time that Clausewitz comes up. Um, uh, uh, I swear it isn't me. Um, I'm not making, just because I'm German, I don't, I'm not making everybody uh, mention Clausewitz. That is a, a natural cause of things. Uh, uh, and and uh, we will see. I'm sure it will change again. But uh, Thank you very much. Um, uh, I appreciate uh, everybody's time uh, uh, and uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, at a webinar near you uh, soon um, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much for your engagement and uh, speak to you all soon. Thank you very much and bye-bye.